Okay, well, welcome to this VET talk. Um, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about um, cardiac auscultation, listening to the heart, and also uh, give you a little bit of an introduction to, to heart murmurs and how we categorize heart murmurs. Obviously, listening to the heart, listening to the chest generally is only part of a full physical examination. We should make every effort to uh, carry out as complete a physical examination as we can in all our patients. Um, cardiac, cardiac auscultation takes time. It does help if you've got a reasonably good uh, stethoscope, and it also helps if you, you develop a standard routine and technique um, which you use each time. Um, get into the habit of doing the same things the same way as far as possible. Ideally, we like the animal in a nice quiet room. Um, again, ideally in a standing position. I understand that that's not always possible. You can see from this image here that this dog's panting, and that is going to make listening to the heart a little bit more difficult. So if we can avoid warm rooms, that helps. There are some techniques you might want to investigate for stopping cats purring, because again, that makes it difficult to listen to the heart. But generally, we want a nice, quiet, well-restrained patient in a standing position. You are going to need some physiology, I'm afraid. Um, you need to understand the cardiac cycle. So if this is not familiar to you, I suggest you pause the recording, go away and have a revise of that, and then, um, and then come back to it. Essentially what we're going to do is we're going to start uh, at the apex beat on the left hand side. Don't underestimate the value of palpating the apex beat in the thorax. It gives you a, a good indication of uh, the rate and rhythm of the heart, whether the heart is indeed in the right hand, right, right place. But it also is the site where we were going to start our auscultation. So we're going to put our stethoscope head on the apex beat on the left hand side. And we're going to listen to the heart, get an idea of rate and rhythm. We also want to spend some time listening to the heart and palpating the femoral pulse or an appropriate uh, superficial pulse at the same time. We're listening for normal heart sounds and we're listening to hear if there are any abnormal sounds such as heart murmurs as well. As you can see in this image, uh, the clinician is auscultating the left hand side of the chest and trying to feel the, the femoral pulse at the same time. But because of the position of the patient and the position that the clinician's in, they're actually making their life quite difficult. Whereas in this image, you can see the clinician's in a comfortable position, very easy to listen to the heart and palpate the pulse at the same time. So make life easy for yourself, make sure you're comfortable, make sure the patient's comfortable. We're going to listen to the heart in the region of all four heart valves. So when we place our stethoscope head uh, over the apex beat on the left-hand side, we're listening to the heart in the region of the mitral valve. If we then push our stethoscope head forward and up, into the axilla underneath the triceps muscle mass we're able to listen to the heart in the region of the pulmonic and the aortic valves and then if we put our stethoscope head on the apex beat on the right hand side we're listening to the heart in the region of the tricuspid valve we want to listen to the uh, heart um, over all of these valve areas and essentially what you need to do is listen over the apex and the base on both sides of the thorax don't worry too much about trying to differentiate pulmonic and aortic areas. Just listen over the apex and the base on the left hand and the right hand side. And then obviously once we finish with the heart, we're going to listen to the rest of the thorax. So you need to understand the cardiac cycle. Um, the pressure in the ventricles, which is the blue line here during diastole, is below the pressure in the atria. So when the ventricle starts to contract in systole, as the ventricular pressure exceeds the pressure in the atrium, then the atrioventricular valve is going to close, and the vibrations associated with that are going to produce the first heart sound, the lub. So S1, the first heart sound, is associated with closure of the mitral and tricuspid valves. So S1 is going to be loudest over the apex of the heart. At the end of ventricular systole, as the ventricular pressure starts to fall, then uh, once that ventricular pressure falls below the pressure in the great vessels in the aorta or the pulmonary artery, then the semilunar valves are going to close and the vibrations associated with that closure produce the second heart sound, S2. So S2 corresponds to closure of the aortic and pulmonic valves and consequently it's loudest over the heart base. So as you move your stethoscope head forward and up into the axilla, S1 will get quieter and S2 should become louder. So what we normally hear are S1 and S2 in a normal animal. S1 at the beginning of ventricular systole, S2 at the end of ventricular systole. So associated with those heart sounds, we should feel the femoral pulse. Heart sounds are going to vary, obviously, um, if the animal is fat or obese or there is a, an effusion in the pleural space or in the pericardial space. 
that might decrease the heart sounds, make it harder to hit, harder for us to hear them. Heart sounds might be increased in young animals, thin animals, athletic animals, or animals with hyperdynamic states. So there's going to be a great deal of variability in heart sound intensity. So the normal animal we should hear S1 and S2. We don't normally hear any other heart sounds. A third heart sound is generated during rapid ventricular filling at the beginning of ventricular diastole. This is a low frequency sound and it's more intense, it's louder if the ventricle is stiff and uncompliant. Not usually audible in dogs and cats, you might hear it in horses over the apex of the heart, particularly on the left side. So this occurs early in diastole as the ventricle fills, as the ventricle fills, the blood hits that ventricle, the ventricle vibrates. So we hear a diastolic heart sound, so whoop boom duh, whoop boom duh, whoop boom duh, one, two, three, one, two, three. The fourth heart sound is generated by contraction of the atria. So it will be associated with the P wave on the ECG. Again, it's a low frequency sound. We don't usually hear it in dogs and cats. We might hear it in the horse over the heart base in the region of the atria. And this is going to occur just before S1 because it's associated with atrial contraction, which occurs just before the ventricle contracts. So we hear, sorry, Four one two, four one two. So we might we might sometimes hear S four. The time when we do hear diastolic sounds are in animals with diseased hearts. Diseased hearts are often stiff; they're less compliant, so they vibrate more during filling. Also, in animals with heart disease, the atria are often enlarged, and as a consequence, in heart disease, S three and S four often get louder, and sometimes they'll summate and we'll get what are called gallop sounds. So instead of just hearing S1 and S2, we hear a gallop sound, which is So those are the, that's one, one particular time when you might hear diastolic sounds, and it's quite useful because it is, if you hear gallop sounds, then it's usually associated with heart disease in most of the species that we deal with. Heart murmurs um, are... Uh, sounds which originate from vibrations within the cardiovascular system and this is usually a consequence of turbulent blood flow. Remember not all animals with heart murmurs have cardiovascular disease and not animals, all animals with cardiovascular disease have heart murmurs. So when we think about turbulence I think it's sometimes helpful to think of a hose. Normally the blood should flow through the cardiovascular system in a nice laminar fashion. If water's coming out of a hose slowly um, under low pressure, then you don't hear it and you don't feel vibration in the hose. If you increase the velocity of flow through the hose, you start to hear the water because it becomes turbulent and the hose will start to vibrate as a consequence of that turbulence. Similarly, if you make the hole smaller, the water comes out under higher velocity, is more likely to be turbulent, will make more noise and cause more vibration. And this is what we're listening to. We're, we're listening to turbulent flow when we hear a heart murmur. We recognise murmurs in animals with, um, with uh, heart pathology, with pathological disease of the heart, particularly with valve disease and congenital diseases. The other thing, time that we might hear a murmur is if the blood becomes very thin. If you think of trying to push oil through a hose pipe, it's going to be much harder to make oil turbulent. Um, so if the blood becomes thin, and one of the best examples is if the animal becomes anemic, then, the, then it, it is much more likely to become turbulent at a lower flow rate. So animals with quite severe anemia usually may have a physiological murmur associated uh, with their low blood viscosity. The other type of murmur we hear are innocent murmurs, and these occur usually in, we hear these in young dogs, and these are occurring in animals that don't have any structural cardiac disease. And these can be a little bit of a problem because when we listen to these dogs when they're young, we might hear a low-grade murmur, loudest over the heart base usually, systolic. The intensity may vary with the heart rate. And an innocent murmur can be a, a, a problem for us because we have to differentiate it from a pathological murmur, particularly in these young dogs. Some of these innocent murmurs will, will resolve within the first 12 months, but we do hear these in, in young dogs um, quite frequently. Our heart murmurs, we describe them primarily in terms of their timing, where they're loudest, their point of maximal intensity, and how loud they are, the intensity or the grade of the murmur. 
we use some other terms to describe murmurs which we'll touch on towards the end. So in terms of murmur timing we're interested to know if they're systolic you will see the terms pansystolic and holosystolic used I wouldn't worry too much about those um, we're interested principally in whether the murmur it occurs during ventricular systole so beginning with or after S1 and ending with or after S2 so what we hear is <laughs> diastolic murmurs occur in ventricular diastole so they occur after S2 so they begin with or after S2 and they end prior to S1 so what we hear is <laughs> We do hear continuous murmurs sometimes which go throughout systole and diastole. So we hear. So we need to know is our murmur systolic, diastolic, or continuous? We also need to know where is it loudest. The, the point of maximal intensity is useful because it helps us to determine the origin of the murmur. And this is why we listen to the apex and the base of the heart. Um, because if the murmur is loudest over the base, it suggests it's more likely to be associated with the valves in the great vessels than with the atrioventricular valves. And some murmurs radiate in a particular direction as a consequence of the blood flow. We grade the loudness of the murmur or its intensity by comparing its loudness to the normal heart sounds, to S1 and S2. So a grade 2 murmur, for example, is easily found um, and it's softer than S1 and S2. Grade 3 murmur has the same intensity as S1 and S2. A grade 4 murmur is louder than S1 and S2. And in a grade 5 murmur, when we put our hands on the body, well, we can actually feel the murmur. Um, we can feel the vibration, the turbulence, without using a stethoscope. And there are some murmurs that are so loud, you don't need to have the stethoscope head on the body wall to hear them. So that would be a grade 6 murmur. Don't worry if you grade murmurs slightly differently from your colleagues who are listening to the same animal. It's a very subjective thing and um, it's just something that you get good at with practice. The other thing we describe sometimes is the shape of the murmur. So we might have a band-shaped murmur associated with a leaky mitral or tricuspid valve which sort of goes It has the same sort of frequency all the way through. In animals with stenosis of the aortic valve or the pulmonic valve we often hear a crescendo decrescendo murmur and the classic decrescendo murmur is the diastolic murmur that we hear in horses with aortic insufficiency so we hear and we've talked a little bit about continuous murmurs that go all the way through the cardiac cycle it might be useful to describe the frequency flow murmurs tend to have a quite a high frequency whereas pathological murmurs, for example, associated with mitral regurgitation, have a mixed frequency and are quite harsh. So the final thing is to put all this together. Do the findings make sense? What do they mean collectively? Are they what you'd expect for this animal? What are you going to do next? Um, remember, cardiac aus auscultation is only part of a full physical exam, you need to put together the findings of the whole physical exam along with your auscultation findings. Unfortunately we can't teach you what hearts sound like. We can give you some guidance as we've just done but you have to go out and learn what heart sounds like simply by listening to lots and lots and lots. So it's over to you, you now need to go and practice and practice and practice. We should have to surgically remove you from your stethoscopes over the next few years. Thank you very much. Thirteen forty one. Pardon? Thirteen forty one. Really? Perfect. Well,